Hi everybody, thanks for joining me, uh, joining up. Um, uh, my name is Peter Llewellyn, if you don't know who I am, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, uh, services, information, resources, activities, and so on, for people who work in and around the global medcoms community, by which I mean people who work in and around medical communications, medical education, medical publishing, and the associated businesses. Um, we also do lots of work for people or, or provide lots of services for people who are interested in working within the business. So if you want to be a medical writer, account manager, and so on. So you'll find lots of information at firstmedcomsjob.com, which hopefully helps you understand the business and, and get a first job. Um, but lots of information at medcomsnetworking.com. And, and we do lots of these sorts of webinars and activities, other sorts of activities, but we capture the, um, the video videos, the recordings of these webinars, you'll find over at Network Pharma TV now, if you've not seen them, uh, there's on the way to 500 videos. Um, so we've got a great collection of, of, um, of expert presentation and, and discussion. Um, what we're doing today, um, very, and, and let's put some context on this, particularly for those of you watching this um, video in, in the coming weeks. Um, yesterday, um, the PMCPA um, issued their new guidelines for social use of social media. Uh, it's something that's been waited for for a very long time. So there's a certain degree of anticipation about this. Um, Jane and I thought it'd be fun to jump straight online and provide a sort of first impressions um, and, and headlines sort of chat about what was present, what was provided yesterday. Um, but this is all this is, okay, we are reacting to what we saw yesterday. Um, and I'm sure over the coming days and weeks and months, lots of people will be having lots of conversations about, um, about these guidelines. Today, we're just simply going, this is what happened yesterday. What should we be thinking about in medcoms? Uh, we're trying to help you think about the sorts of things that you should be thinking about in your own team meetings. Okay. Um, it will be run as a short presentation and Q&A. Um, so those of you in the audience today, please get ready to share your thoughts and your comments and your questions in the chat boxes as usual. So no more uh, from me. Uh, Jane, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and talk us through a short presentation and then it's over to Q&A. Jane, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Right. Let me just um, share some slides, get those sorted. And here we go. Peter, just give me a nods up. Is it all looking OK from your end? Perfect. Thank you very much. Well, Peter, first of all, Medcom's sort of uh, network. Thank you so much for, oh, my word, reacting to the news yesterday, uh, dropping me an email, having a quick call. And it's just uh, great to be here talking about the, the latest social media guidelines. And say so they've launched yesterday. So I'm going to be looking very much at key takeaways um, as, as we go through and just trying to give you a bit of, you know, sort of my viewpoint, uh, some key takeaways, um, but really what you need to do is go and read the guidelines. Um, but uh, let's give you some heads up. Now, just before I dive in, let me just do a quick introduction and also a few comments about this session. So just be aware that I'm not here giving you advice. So it's so important you look at the code, the context, the new guidelines before you make any sort of big business decisions and stuff. And you will be aware that social media, oh my word, is such a fast moving space. So if you're listening to this session later as a recording, don't rely completely on the accuracy, okay? The cases come through, the landscape changes, but here we are, here and now, we're good, uh, we're good on this session today. Now, if we've not met before, in a nutshell, uh, so I'm Jane Packham, um, I am a code of practice, ABPI code of practice um, expert. I've spent just over 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry, working inside industry, and then for the last 20 plus years, I've had my own company. And I love working with um, loads of medcoms agencies, um, pharmaceutical companies as well, just keeping you up to date with the code and trying to unpick it and make it clear and sensible and practical and that is my big aim giving some clarity around it so yes the guidance is here um, if you've not had chance to have a little glance then look you can find it on the home page of the pmcpa website the document, I have to say, the PMCPA have got some new branding out, the document in terms of the look and the feel. My initial impression was, yes, I like it. It spans 20 pages, but uh, when I put my writing hat on, yes, there's lots of white space and things. So it makes it quite a nice, attractive uh, you know, um, document to read. And what I particularly like is that they have pulled together not only sort of pertinent 
um, you know, points from the code. They've pulled in lots of really relevant case examples to try and demonstrate the points so that we can actually have a bit more interpretation. So it's not just about you can't do this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm positive about it. I would actually, as a tip though, say don't bother printing it out. Okay, it comes out quite small. Okay, I suppose it's social media; it's digital, so just you know, find it online, um, enlarge the size, and, and go with it there. But I know a lot of us have been waiting for this, so you know, it looks good. But the devil is in the detail about what does it say, and is it going to fit for purpose? I do just want to manage one question: Why have we been waiting for? It feels like years and years. I'm not here to defend the PMCPA, um, you know, and completely independent from them. But what I would say slightly in their defense is that this has probably been a massive document to pull together because this is not just about the UK going, oh, what should we do with social media? It is way, way bigger than that. And we've got to think about social media and medicines as much more of a, you know, a global initiative. And it really is. We have had some really important documents which have been published over the last few months and things. And so when I look at the guidance, is there much in there for me as an expert where I'm thinking, oh, well, there are little nuggets that I'm going to share with you. But look, the key documents are really is that the FBS, so that lovely European Code of Practice, they incorporated digital guidance quite some months ago. Um, in there. This then cascaded into the international code, issuing this joint note for guidance on social media and digital channels. And they published that at the end of September 2022. So my guess, personal opinion, is that the PMCPA were probably waiting for this to come through, waiting for it to bed down. And then, of course, in drafting the guidance, they've got to have lots of cross-industry discussion and, of course, lengthy discussion with the MHRA because they are the ones that are managing the law and setting the guidance. So the PMCPA work incredibly closely with the MHRA. So this was never going to be something, once that had been published, that was going to happen overnight. But let's say, having said that, that, you know, um, you know, there's been lots of media hype. There's been lots of discussion about when's it coming? What's it going to say and things? And all I can say, I think this is the equivalent of the the Harry publication of Spare. You know, it has been such, you know, a long awaited document. So, um, you know, that is the that is the highlight of the, the, the Q1 um, in terms of code land. So let us dive in. OK, I think. This is so overdue and so needed. And I'll give you my impressions just in a minute, but I do want to give you just a bit of a, of a backstory to it. Back in 2022, there were around 100 cases, which I summarized uh, for people keeping them up to date, you know, pharma companies, agencies and things. Just for the context, 22 of those related to social media. 16 different companies were involved and 73% of those cases ended up in breaching the code. So social media covers all these different platforms and stuff. Um, and so, you know, long awaited and desperately needed to give some clarity to keep us on the right side of, of the code. So as a quick sort of deep dive, no, not even deep dive, top level dive, you know, what does this guidelines um, include? So it starts off initially with principles for social media activity. And it's great. It goes back to what does the law say? What does the code say? Um, it pulls out the really critical requirement about pharmacovigilance monitoring. So as soon as companies start talking about their medicines, and if somebody on social media were then going to say, OK, and I got this side effect by taking the drug. Of course, that is something that the pharmaceutical industry need to monitor and track and try and fulfill their PV reporting requirements. So not unsurprisingly, it covers the importance of that. And it also just sets a really good scene about laws and regulations so that don't gloss over it. It is a useful scene setting section. And then it goes into specific topics. These are just a few that I'm going to sort of cover. Um, you know, some of them pull out links, hashtags, disease awareness, meetings. What can we do on social there? It mentions about influencers as well. Um, and it does also talk about that if you want to share a publication through your you know, personal account, through your company account, you know, what about that? So I'll cover that one in just one moment. That is a more comprehensive list 
of what the guidance includes. Okay, so look, somebody put in the chat, what about clinical trial recruitment? There are a few words in there. So I think whatever space that you're in, and I know that agencies, gosh, come to social media with all sorts of different hats on. So I think there is something in this guidelines for, for everybody. And it's one of those you can just dip in and read the information because I do think it's a really well-written document, um, actually. And here, I'm sticking my neck out. So we've had sight of this just for a few hours. And I know that people are going to say, so Jane, what do you think? Is it fit for purpose? You know, so yeah, I'm putting my neck out here. I actually genuinely do think it's a really useful guideline. Absolutely. It gives us some really clear principles. And what I particularly like on page five, it gives you a little chart of the key questions to consider before carrying out any social media activity. So they've really gone for a really helpful checklist to enable us to you know, think these campaigns and, and strategies just through. It does give more clarity for extra areas as well. And what they've done is they've pulled in lots of random code cases and put that in. So that is great news as well. I have to say, there are a few vague sentences in there that I, as an expert, and I put some question marks, I'm thinking, what does that mean? So there's lots of unpicking to do. But we've got this inter interesting juxtaposition as well, where the PMCPA say one thing in terms of based on code cases, but then the MHRA have caveated it almost with the, well, this is actually what the law says. And this is where you've got a slightly different interpretation of this. So an example is, you know, talking about medicines before they've got a marketing authorization. The PMCPA splits it out into different stages pre-MA, but the MHRA doesn't. So we've got this little bit of almost, a, if I could call it a, a banter, you can see the, you know, that um, leveling up of the two viewpoints, which are incredibly important. And then the final thing is I just want to face into is that some of you may still be reading the guidelines and you may be saying, well, it doesn't cover this. It doesn't cover that. Let's just set out the scene for this. This is not meant to be a comprehensive, definitive guide, okay? Answering every single question that you might have. It would be impossible for them to do it. So we're still gonna have to challenge things and we're gonna have to wait and see, right, you know, where is the precedence if there is an allegation of a breach? But with the principles at the beginning, with that checklist, there are some very pragmatic viewpoints and examples. You know, I think it gives us plenty of information, you know, to go out, to help us shape and uh, you know, be creative and uh, potentially, you know, have some fun on social media, you know, in a bit more of a confident way. So look, let me just go through those principles just in case you're not on the same page, just very, very brief, briefly and pull out a few pertinent comments as we go through. The six big areas that you need to think about that they cover here. I think the first one, I'm delighted to see that they're talking about the channel setup. So they're absolutely acknowledging that not all social media is an open platform. So it's saying that if you want to have a closed group where you've identified the audience, maybe for patients on a medicine, maybe for promotional materials to healthcare professionals, maybe for journalists for press releases, then consider that as another more creative way of using social media, but in a compliant way. The big one, of course, is the content. And this is what it's saying in terms of that. And really, I don't think there's any surprises here that if you are going to be talking about medicinal products on social media, then this is then sending a big risk of advertising to the public if you are putting that onto an open channel where everyone can see. So there's no change there, you know, but I don't think anyone suddenly expected them to say, yes, we can promote medicines. So this brief is all about licensed medicines, but it just goes in as well as to what about pre-MA. As this is more on say one of these positions where PMCPA are talking about investigational, a drug during the development, um, the MHRA have just got a broader statement on it saying, you know, you should not be talking about medicines pre-MA. And I've just put in here an interesting little comment from the PMCPA about, you know, the scope of this is not just about investigation or during the development, but they also say it's any medicine where a marketing authorization has been applied for anywhere in the world. 
So I take it that they are really trying to encourage us to pull back, and we've had some cases, pull back about talking about medicines in development. So check that out on page nine. And of course, just a reminder, hopefully you're all trained on this, you know, what is promotion, but it is highly likely that if you mention a product name and it's an associated indication, that is going to be seen as promotional. And that is, a, you know, a fundamental thing. Next one's moving on as well is what I think they're also really putting a lot of emphasis on is the next big three, transparency of the posts. Of course, you've got to think about approval and then it's the interactions, nothing new here, sharing, liking, commenting and things. But I just want to touch on that transparency because again, they're expanding this out from a lot of the other materials that we'll be doing that are covered in the code. So if a company or of course, Medcom's community, you are seen as a third party contracted for an industry, so you're in this as well. If you put something onto social media, they are just making it very clear that it's got to have that transparency statement. So it's got to make it very clear in a prominent way. So by this, we talk, we talk about, you know, at the outset of this post, that a company is involved. Now, practically, how are you going to do this? It's not dictated. So it's up to everybody to you know, decide that. But you need to make sure on a visual, on a post, that at the outset, that it is really obvious that this post has come from company A. I do not know if just by having the account name, company name, company logo, that is sufficient. I expect not. So there may have to be extra words in there to make it super clear. But I stress that is my personal opinion and one for you to discuss with clients and to debate as to how you can fulfill that, that requirement. They then throw in a few other comments about legal stuff. Um, I, I loved it. There is just almost like one statement. Oh, and don't forget to consider GDPR and data privacy. They don't go into a detail as to what that means. So I'm just throwing it out there. You've got to think about it. And again, coming back to the pharmacovigilance a bit, they do give us, you know, some practical thoughts about if you're putting posts out there, you've got to think about what if that patient or that member of the public suddenly starts talking about, you know, safety and side effects. And so to help compliance there, it's either about, right, somebody needs to be monitoring those comments that are coming in, or maybe more straightforward and simple is think about restricting comments. So turning off the, you know, the, the comment option. And again, if you're planning campaigns, immediately thinking to me is that, you know, this is not just about involving maybe, you know, the commercial teams, the PR teams, make sure that the pharmacovigilance bit has got a seat at the planning stage to make sure that that has been involved. And with that lovely GDPR, maybe you need to get the lawyers in, in the discussion as well to think, OK, you know, how do we you know, get that involved? So these are some of my just initial thoughts, you know, for compliance along the way. There may well be more partners to, to pull in. Now, I just want to pull a few bits in about medcoms. You will know that the pharmaceutical company that you're working for is responsible for any acts and emissions. And there are just a few more pointers that I just want you to have a little look at on page six of the guidelines. So it's saying here that contracts with third parties from a pharma side should deal comprehensively with ownership and control both during and after the contracted period that they're working with you. And here, you know, I go into a bit of a, a woolly bit, you know, both during, I get that. But what about after the contracted period? We have had a code case on this where it was some years later, um, a company posted, a, an agency posted something. But because of the length of gap between the contract ending, you know, they were able to say no, they were no longer under the um, jurisdiction of the, the sort of the, the pharmaceutical company and stuff. But You've got to think about that and define as to what does that period look like? It doesn't tell us. This is for each company to make their own decision. And as well, another thing as well for you to keenly keep in mind, companies are strongly advised, is what they're saying, to preview social media from their contracted parties in relation to their contracted services. 
So again, if you are working in a space and you are posting things, you know, which is in the area related to what you're working with, with an agency, you've got to think about that. So again, just talk to your clients as to what does this practically mean? It may well be that there is a longer process. We want to be really speedy, just like Peter and I have been today. We want to be newsworthy, get stuff out there. But that, for some clients, may just hold you back slightly because they've got to, you know, examine, review, um, certify, you know, those sorts of posts. And not surprisingly, you have got to have regular training on responsible conduct on social media is what they're saying. So just... Uh, I know I'm biased, but keep your training up to date. And this is a massive hot topic. It does as well cover personal accounts um, as well. Again, we've had code breaches on this, and I'm delighted that they've brought all these code breaches in. So it's all in one place as a simple guide and stuff. And so don't forget that your personal accounts still can come in scope. And this is what it says, and this is based from European and that international guidance. So if the employee, and I would extrapolate that into the third party, you know, as well, can reasonably be perceived as representing the company, then that post could then come in scope of the ABPI code. And likewise, if the employee is instructed, approved or facilitated by the company to do so, then again, those posts will come in scope of the code. We've got a few sort of, you know, wiggle bits. Did I put them? Yeah, on, on a slide I did. And so, look, my take home for you on this is absolutely check your personal profiles. Have you got any mentions of prescription only medicines on your personal profiles? What the code is saying, what this guideline is saying, that please don't include any mentions in maybe your job titles, in your top line descriptions on your social media profiles. But it does actually say that it might be OK. And I stress that word might because all these cases are done on a case by case basis. It might be OK, maybe you know, lower down on your personal profile, maybe that experience section. And if people are having to scroll down, they're having to click things, they're having to search actively to find that, then it might be OK to mention prescription medicines. But there is still an overarching thought is why would you? when we've got such strong legislation against it. So that is one, please beetle away, just go and look and see to reduce your risk of, you know, breaches for your clients and keeping yourselves in a really good place. Now, this is one that came up in the Q&A, proactively sharing a publication. This is on page eight, page eight of the guidelines. And what they do is they actually refer back to the European FPA code, which actually gives us very, I think, clear guidance. Use of social media directed to the public, alerting health professionals about the publication of a study on a medicinal product is also likely to be considered promotion of that medicinal product and is therefore prohibited. So that applies across the whole of Europe. It's being pulled in. So my take on this is, look, I think they're pulling out some really important things. The study on a medicinal product. So we're going back to this principle. We can't be advertising products, you know, to the public. Um, so I could read into this if the publication is much broader you know, and it doesn't mention any medicines, then maybe, but gosh, you have got to work really closely with your client um, to get and get their permission and their review to enable you to do that. So I think you need to be super careful about pushing things out and just keep in mind it's within the contracted service area. So again, my take, but for discussion is that if there is, you know, a therapy area that you're working on that is completely outside of scope um, for, you know, a contractual arrangement with a pharmaceutical company, then I'm going to use very, very lightly, then maybe, maybe there's some scope there, but just be really careful about any studies which are talking about medicinal products and recognize that you're a third party. So just go back and reread that on page eight and just, just discuss it, but it is not a given. I'm sure that is gonna prompt questions. I'm sure we do not have all the answers on it. 
Okay, but at least we now have something that at least gives us a, a, a parameter. Um, I can see some questions coming in. I'm not looking at them. Peter, should we leave them till the end? And I'll just, just carry on. Yeah, we'll, ca we'll carry on, give you a few other things. So look, a few other little nuggets um, just to, to have in there that I think are, are noteworthy, that's worth pulling out. Sometimes if you're going to be doing social media posts, you're going to link to other articles. But a reminder that the, the, in the scope of the code, the post includes not only the artwork, the text of the post, but also any linked articles and any articles linked within the linked articles as well. We've got that through cases. So you've absolutely got to do your due diligence. And if you're going to be linking through, you've got to check what those links are saying. The links have got to be labeled clearly. And another little thing they've added in is that the ownership of that information has got to be clearly stated. So it comes back to transparency. Is this the farmer you know, link that you're going to, or is this as an independent you know, link that you're going to? So a few extra words has got to go in. They've given us an update on hashtags as well. And all I can say is you need to be very careful about hashtags and hashtags. If there is a hashtag which is linked to a promotional claim for a prescription medicine, then hopefully no surprises. That's going to be seen as promotional. But it also gives us a little example using a hashtag of hashtag obesity. And what it says in there, if that hashtag is used in combination with other language that could identify a prescription only medicine. Again, that might be promotional. It's one that needs a bit of working through and a bit of thought as to how you can practically use, you know, hashtags and things. But I just want to flag it as a really important discussion point, um, you know, that you can't just hashtag anything. We've got to think co-compliance in those hashtags. Other ones as well. I'm actually really pleased to see this called out. And when I train, this actually frequently comes up, uh, you know, particularly for some companies who are maybe having a, you know, a bad time with the press and the public who have got, you know, if I could call it sort of vendettas against, you know, some products and things. What about, you know, misinformation or maybe inaccuracies that you spot in posts and you think that is just blatantly wrong. And so, They've gone back to the original guidance, but it's in there as well. And they're saying that it is OK to cross reference to maybe, you know, a document like the summary of product characteristics, maybe the patient information leaflet. But they are wanting you to, to um, you know, cross reference to the whole of the document. They do not want you to link to a specific section of it because then you are directing them too much to specific information and you're making a judgment and, you know, forcing them to a bit so do a top line link and then I was actually quite quite interested to hear that they're giving us another opportunity as well now some companies have got something called reference information on their websites if you've not come across it this is almost a library of information for the public about medicines but all in a non-promotional way and that reference information there is normally, you know, people would go and hunt it out. Um, we're not sort of, you know, pushing it out proactively, but they've actually added in a little bit of a, almost an exception um, in this guidelines and saying that if you spot that misinformation, you could proactively link to your company's reference information if you've got it on that social media post. So that's a new one, which is a bit against the code, um, but it's there in the guidelines, so it opens up an opportunity. And I'm delighted because it's all about getting good quality information out there, which is at the heart of what we do. So I'm delighted to see, you know, that extra bit in there, you know, and, and clarification for us. Signposting, I'm really pleased to see this one as well, because this has been um, a big topic. Imagine that a pharma company is organizing an event. And there have been a number of code cases where people have said, right, even if this is event is aimed at healthcare professionals, can we then, um, you know, put it onto social media? And they're covering this. So in effect, to paraphrase it, they're saying that, yeah, you could put a non-promotional invite for a promotional meeting aimed at UK healthcare professionals onto social media. 
please, please read the guidelines because there are lots of caveats as to how you can and can't do it. Validating attendees. And of course, you never want to provide promotional content before you've absolutely checked that they truly are a healthcare professional. Lots of caveats, so go and look at it. But I'm really pleased that it gives us some clarity and again, could open up lots of opportunities and things. So look, just to conclude, last sort of couple of slides, there are also lots of other possibilities. You know, there is lots of positive stuff in this, this guidelines um, that, you know, they're saying that as we've known, of course, we can do certain things on social media. A lot of companies, you know, just run away. But no, it's talking about certain types of posts. And these are all mentioned in sections. So it's all about non-promotional stuff in those open channels. So company awards, you know, executive appointments. Um, it calls out, out a section on disease awareness. And as long as we've got no direct, indirect mentions about specific medicines and we're following the code and the blue guide and things, then yeah, you may be able to put stuff about disease awareness. And it calls out linking it to a dedicated Facebook page, you know, for that disease awareness campaign. Press releases, I want to call out. This is an important one. Um, so look, PR agencies, if anybody is here in that space, please just go and look at press releases in there because they have changed um, what you are allowed to do. And it's there on page 15 is, is the call out. Lots of caveats, quite a big topic, but it used to be a blanket ban that do not put press releases on social media, but they've given us a few more pointers, which are going to be really, really welcomed. And they've got things about clinical trial recruitment as well. And the key thing there is just don't mention names of medicines. But then just to put a downer on it as a last thing, yeah, I'm probably not to be surprised at it's saying, please don't put information about medicines, pipeline assets, you know, clinical research where you're mentioning medicines, because it comes back to that principle, you know, that we cannot be advertising prescription medicines, you know, to the public. So look, that is my really quick romp through. As Peter said at the, at the beginning, I'm really happy to, to help out, share, you know, expertise, you know, if you need any code training, you know, get, get in touch um, and, and things, you know, whether it's just keeping up to date um, and things. I've actually got a free social media planning tips thing. I need to go back. I think it is still fit for purpose. So look, uh, that's on my website. And please, you know, just um, I know there is going to be lots of discussion. So please just join me on LinkedIn to keep the discussion going. It's going to be through, um, you know, the Medcoms, you know, network as well. But um, anything important, you know, I do tend to post on LinkedIn. So feel free to hunt me out and uh, share the information. So there we go, Peter. That's that's my my rush through these guidelines. Excellent. And a, a marvellous job, Jane. A marvellous job. Can we lose the slide? Um, and to the audience that are here today, um, I, 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 you know, please use the chat box, Q&A box, just to chuck all your questions and comments in. Um, I'm, I'm going to say now that I don't think we'll cover most of them. <laughs> There's quite a few that have come in. Some of them are very specific. Um, and I think uh, we need to be a bit careful um to to go down some very specific avenues here but the sorts of comments and questions you've got are really interesting to us and to jane um and and if you share them with it will help us all think about the different issues and um, jane i'm going to ask you to go right back to basics because i'm i was just very aware when we we're talking a couple of the questions that came in just very briefly can you set the theme so pmcpa social media guidelines um apply you know it's from the pmcpa in the uk um, you know, people talk about the ABPI guidelines. You've mentioned FPA, you've mentioned IFPMA, but can we just very quickly set the scene so we understand the context of what these guidelines are basically aimed at? I think that's useful for people who are not so familiar with some of the others. Yeah, yeah. So if I go back to, to real basics, we've got a cascade of different compliance codes globally. So we start off at the very top level with the, the international that IFPMA guidance. Anything in there that has to be cascaded into the European guidelines and everything in the European guidelines is then cascaded into the local codes across each country within Europe. So strangely, Europe, the FPA guidance came out before the international guidance. So this is quite an unusual one, but so we've got stuff into the European code. It's right at the end in an annex. Then in September, they then, you know, pull out and said, right, okay, top level, let's give some guidance. 
And I say, that's what I then think the PMCPA and uh, you've been waiting for is let's get all that aligned. And then we can then see what the big picture is before we push it out into, you know, specific guidelines for the UK. And I'm just spelling this out. But when people talk about the ABPI code of practice, they're talking about. So that that was your cue. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah. So whenever you hear the code, ABPI code, the um, it's all one and the same. And the PMCPA just administer the code on behalf of the ABPI and on behalf of the the MHRA. So the all the interesting stuff, if I can put it that way, actually comes out from the PMCPA, but it's badged ABPI representing the industry. Yeah. Okay. Again, let's not get bogged down, but I think it's important that people tune themselves in or go and Google it or something like that and understand the issues, right? Okay. Go on. Or you're going to jump in. Go on. Yeah. And there was just one little extra thought for you. You know, if you've seen this, just a little call out for the PMCP, actually, they are going to be running a couple of webinars. Um, If you're here live on the session, go onto the PMCPA website. They've got a couple of dates in. Of course, um, they're in the next sort of few weeks. So if you're wanting to hear it from them, go and hunt those out. Um, And again, there'll be chance to ask more questions there. So it's just an important thought that I wanted to add as well. And and just on an ongoing basis, PMCPA provides an ongoing education. And and it's a, you know, and and as my understanding has always been PMCPA very, you know, in principle, very happy to talk. Basically, it's better to reach out to them than to sit and moan about them sort of thing from a distance. And um, a lot of the questions that are coming in, I think, are to or some of the questions that are coming in are to do with who's accountable. You, you've talked about. Um, so so Trish has asked about patient advocates, someone was asking about publishers, you know, um, I don't know, I haven't seen it yet. But like if I'm a freelancer working for an agency, working for a client, you know, what's that chain of command? How at what point do, are, are, is everybody just caught up in this? You, you've made that point that, um, you know, basically suppliers to the companies, you know, are. Mm-hmm. But how far does that go? If you're a publisher publishing journal articles, can you... Can you freely quote those or is there is there freedom or not? I mean, just try and take some of those extreme examples. Where do the lines get drawn? Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm-hmm. So the scope of the, the of the ABPI code and these guidelines obviously is very much UK. But yes, yeah, sometimes it can go into d- different geographical um, territories as well. So if like a journal publisher, um, then it comes into as to where is the journal published? um it just yeah where is it sort of um compiled edited it's that type of type of thing so i would go back to that thing on page six that if you're wanting to push out publications it's really just to think that if you are contractive actively with a company and if you are working in that space with the publication which you're highly likely to you've just got to think twice think about compliance and think right so, so, sorry medicines mm. Okay, so sorry to butt in, but let's just take the very simple scenario. I'm I, I'm a journal publisher. I'm clearly based in the UK. Yeah. I'm publishing an article, a peer review article, you know, about a medicine. Um, am I free to just go? I've just published this article about this medicine that happens to be, you know, I'm trying to understand and just keep okay, it. Okay, so know, the publisher. It's very simple. But as a publisher, how much freedom yeah. do I have? Yeah. So as a publisher, sorry, misunderstood that. So as a publisher, if that publisher is nothing to do with the pharmaceutical industry, then this code is just about the actions of the pharmaceutical company, the pharmaceutical company employees and any third parties working on their behalf. So if a publisher wants to publish something out there, then they can do that off their own back. Okay, now let's add the wiggle in. And Tim's actually just yes. asked the question that I was heading towards. So a lot of open access publishing, uh, processing charges and so on. So I'm now a pharma company paying the um, the processing charge to get that published open access. I now Do I now have that business relationship with the journal publisher such that they cannot do something? You see what I mean? My my thought on that as to what you can and can't go is almost go to go to the principles and just think about, right, what is in that article? If in that article there is a medicine which is mentioned that you are working on, that your company is acting as a third party with that pharmaceutical company, that's when you've got to then stop and think about compliance. OK, so if it's mentioning their medicine, 
and you're working with them, the answer is going to be, you know, from that from that page six or whatever. No, because you would then be acting and pushing out information, which is naming a medicine. Yeah. Um, I, so that's I, I where think the that's no right. Comes in. Mm. I think that's right. But that that actually raises all sorts of potential problems. I would have thought. So I'm trying to keep up with the comments that are coming mm. in as well. Uh, just 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 take that. Sorry, that simple example that I've started to think about. You know, I'm a freelancer. I'm working for an agency. We're working on a project for a drug company. You know, can I go? Oh look, mum, I've just on Twitter. Oh look, mum, I've just published a paper. You know, about medicine X or something. I can't. Can I? If you're contracted and part of it, then no. Because you're part of that chain. You're yeah, part of that yeah, chain. Yeah, um, yeah. And one of the things you touched on about the whole sort of, I mean, there's part of my brain, and, and I'm one of the people that have jumped up in the past and gone, come on, come on, we need some guidance. But, you know, it's, you need to be careful what you wish for. I mean, so you're, you're actually, and it's lovely, the enthusiasm. I, I, I sense this has made your week sort of thing, um, <laughs> the, the issue of these guidelines. Um, but, you know, and it's lovely that there are opportunities. But actually, mm. now it's written down, there's going to be a lot of thoughts having to be applied to things. And actually, it may even cause, it will, it will cause some problems because yeah. things we talked about, but it's not written down, and it is now written down. And I think that's going to, that's going to create some really interesting discussions. Yeah. Um, you raise so such I'm, an important point because people have been screaming for these guidelines and you raise such an important point that as soon as this goes into guidelines, we then know where it stands. So yeah. sometimes <laughs> it's almost better to, um, you know, Stay in your own lane. Be confident that you could defend something under the code if if alleged. And then, you know, maybe then see in a code case what the ruling is. Maybe take it to appeal so it doesn't set case precedents and stuff. But you're right. There are pros and cons of guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just picking up on this one, again, we're sticking with publications. I mean, I'd, I'd like we can mm. get off this in a second. But um, to follow on the sort of publisher type scenario, if an author of a study shares the publication on their own social media account. Again, how would you view that? Yeah, so I'd have to unpick it and go back. OK, so we'd have to think, right, who, who is the author? Let's say they're, they're a healthcare professional. Have they been paid and contracted, even if not even paid, but they have been, have they been contracted via a pharmaceutical company to write that article? If they have, if they've then got a contracted service agreement in place, then yes, it can then bring it in scope of the code. And have a look at the influencer section. Um, I'm also not going to go yeah. into it in masses of detail, but it does mention that. But that's the sort of things that you need to, to think about. And it's like, if they're going to be sharing things, they've got to be transparent that they have been involved, just like if they're a speaker in a meeting. Hello, I'm involved with company X. So it's going back to those key points. But look at the influence a bit. Um, and again, it's coming up already in the chat. It's like it's not it's not as simple as saying the author wasn't paid to write that paper because the author as a PI was paid, contracted potentially to run the study or supporting the study. There is a business relationship there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And, we've and, not and you know, in many cases, you can't write, you can't pay them to write the paper, but you're going to write the paper because that's part of the deal. That's what yeah, you're supposed yeah. to be doing. Sort of thing. And we've not got that precise level of detail in these guidelines it said that you know well if we've got this you know if they've contracted if it's in a different country i can see lots of things you know what about outside of the uk we've not got that prescriptive level so i'm afraid we've got some pointers but it's in the case of talk it through and talk it through with your clients that is the most important because they've got to be comfortable with everything you're doing because you're their third party and obviously something that scares the heck out of me is when you may, you, you, I don't know whether you can realise that you flippantly, or maybe flippantly, maybe not, suggested that, you know, meetings are now going to include lawyers and, you know, anything that involves more lawyers in these discussions worries the heck out of me. Um, but there's a fundamental conflict, isn't there, which has always been there. Um, you know, social media is about responding quickly to things, having conversations with people. You know, there's no point getting i don't know a tweet from somebody going into a system with lawyers and everybody else and coming out six weeks later with a carefully constructed response to the tweet that's not how social media works sort of thing so there's a very there's a fundamental problem in there and again you touched on it i think at one point you said you know in some of these situations it may be just better to to shut off the commenting and things but that's not what social media that no. complete conflict in there for lots no. of us about how no. that works um we're going to run around of time we are going to run out of time and we should be careful here again all we're trying to do here guys if you're watching this is raise some of the topics you should be thinking yeah. about for yourselves that's very yeah. important but i did just want to touch on the transparency thing because again it's something uh, depends on the situation space but i mean 
you know, when, when they say things like, you know, it's got to be clear, that, you know, you look at the like a, a, a banner ad or something. I know that's been up in, in the, in the in, you know, being talked about a lot recently, a banner ad, you know. Mm -hmm. How much information do you put on that banner? How much information do you put in a tweet? If you've got to be transparent from the front, you, it's, you know, there's practical problems in there, isn't there? And, and, and mm -hmm. you know, transparency is easy to say, but actually in this sort of environment with small graphics or small numbers of characters, or that's, that's going to be a huge problem area, isn't it? But if you're saying something, you know, you've got to add in caveats and, and link... And, that's actually going to be a problem. I mean, I, I suppose I'm just stating the obvious, but, you know, yeah. have you got a comment yeah. on that front? They've always, even in the old guidelines, old 2016 guidelines, have called out Twitter as a particular yeah. problem because you are so restricted from with, with characters. And you're right. Now you've got to, you know, have, you know, that, that transparency bit and you've probably gobbled up all your characters before you've got to anything, you know, newsworthy and interesting at all. So Twitter has always been problematic. There's nothing, there's nothing changed there at all. Um, but otherwise, yeah, um, you've just got to, you know, figure out up front, you know, that it's absolutely clear that the pharmaceutical company has been involved. Um, and I think what will happen now, say, and what I just encourage people to do is A, read through the guidelines, think about the own areas that you're working in. And then just remind yourselves, you know, of the principles and things. If it doesn't feel right, then it's probably not right, you know, as a principle. And just work with your clients that, that, that you are there with because you are acting on their behalf. And companies vary hugely as to what they can and can't do, hugely. So make sure you're aligned with their social media policy. Um, they, I think, are the, the big take homes. Have lots okay. of discussion. Mm. Okay. Okay. Look, there's, there's a lot more. I feel we could talk about, I'm sure there is, and there's a load of questions and comments we haven't even started to address. Um, for the purposes of today, I think we've done a great job of just raise, a, raising awareness that the codes, the, the guidelines have been published yesterday. Um, uh, if you're looking at this in a number of weeks time, you, some of what we're talking about here might have been clarified or not. Um, but hopefully what we're doing today is we're raising the issues, oh. we're giving people something to think about. Um, and and I would love to be a fly on the wall in some of the meeting rooms over the next few days as people sit and, and yes. think about this. OK, right. So um, a part of the point of these webinars is just to make connections with people. I would I cannot emphasize enough. Jane is very happy to hear from you via LinkedIn is an easy way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Please do follow up and, and follow up with your questions and so on. Um, and um I'm going to call hold to the recording. For the people in the audience, uh, don't rush away. We've got a few minutes, a couple of minutes uh, before we actually wrap up so we can carry on going for a little bit. Uh, but for the recording, thank you very much. Huge thank you to Jane. Uh, thank you to the audience. Look after yourselves, guys. And if we all just give a quick wave um, and um, <laughs> say goodbye.